Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for joining in. I have a special guest today for today's interview. Sergio Negus, thank you so much for taking the time and being here today. Hi. Uh, Glad and to meet you. Um, I want to read you a little bit about Sergio so that you know who he is. So Sergio Negus is a business angel who invested and developed grow com and grew companies such as like Frufru to performance, soft intelligence, soft intelligence, Bitnet, Intermedicas. Before that, he was an executive of the pharma giant Amgen and executive director of Regina Maria Healthcare Centers. In the present, Sergio is also an associate dean of the Maastricht School of Management Romania, where he teaches business growth, management, and many other things. He's very fond of technology, and he believes in the power of impact investment. Because success is not about all about the money, but it's also about what you build. So, first question. Yeah, that's a summary. Yeah, it's a good summary, right? <laughs> yeah, so, it's a good one. Fir first question would be. If you could tell us a little bit of your story so that people can get a little bit of a context of the overall thing. I know I had my intro a little bit, but like, take us back to um, your story. From yeah, when I was a little child. No. Yeah, like, <laughs> and so well, this moment. Um, uh, basically, I'm, I'm, um, I started as a computer engineer and uh, I did a bit of programming um, during my undergrad. And uh, doing a bit, of, a bit of programming in uh, Romania of those days wasn't that glamorous as it may be today. So um, I basically worked uh, for, for the um, Apple platform uh, at the time. And one day, uh, some colleagues of mine were installing a network to a client. And they needed some help, so they got me along. And I had a short interview there with an you know, American businessman. And the American businessman asked me if I could come and join him for a few months for a project. And I've joined him for a few months for the project, um, eventually because he wanted to pay me double. And I figured out during that time that people in uh, business were making much more money than what I was making. And I had a girlfriend at the time and I wanted to have some independence. So I um, approached my boss, you know, I want to switch to business. I want to do things, you know, I want to, you know, make things that happen and, you know, that count and stuff like that. And he was very open to, to, to my suggestion. So I switched to business, increased my salary, got responsibility, started, you know, to work like 18 hours per day and stuff like that at weekends and everything. And um, I grew, I grew when, uh, within that, you know, it was a commercial organization where trading steals and uh, so on. And after a while, um, I started to be uh, sort of take my boss's place and he would rely upon me to do things and he would be taking care of his things. So um, after a while he retired from the business and I re uh, remained in charge. And I grew to become, at a very early age, you know, I was like 26, 27, I was already sort of a country manager, uh, $20 million operations in Romania and so on, and it was quite glamorous. The problem was only the industry, because in steel trading, um, things were changing, things were changing very fast. There was one particular organization, Mittal Steel from India, that was acquiring everything and they had the distribution network everywhere. Because they had the distribution network everywhere, uh, there was no place for middlemen like us. So that's when I had to switch and I thought, you know, the best thing would be to do a very good school and go to probably the best MBA that I could, you know, go to. And I started to do my research. I figured that I, that would require an investment of maybe you know up to a hundred thousand dollars at the time. So I thought, you know, how would I be getting this money? And I I realized that I understood how the industry worked. I'm talking about the steel industry. So I found some clients of mine, I set up a company, and I started to consult for them on steel acquisition. Uh, you know, basically saving them millions and me making some commissions and some consulting fees that allowed me to pay for a very expensive MBA. So I went to INSAD and this is the thing that actually changed my life. Mm. Uh, because I did my research on the uh, number of MBAs, went on, on site to, to three of them, one in the States, uh, two in Europe, and I chose at the end of the day, I chose INSAD. INSAD is still, I believe, the best management school in the world uh, because it's very international. It's truly international mm -hmm. and you really get to interact uh, with everybody else without anyone of any particular nationality having uh, an edge over the others. Right. So it's a very democratic platform. It's very, um, and it's also because it's not in a city, 
everyone is kind of forced to mingle, mingle with the others. So it's, uh, it's a very special environment and very, very advanced knowledge and very smart people and uh, lots of experience there. So I did my uh, MBA at INSEAD. INSEAD uh, brainwashed me, I like to say. Uh, That's interesting. And I, this is the kind of brainwashing that gives you the instincts for a business. It doesn't give you knowledge because knowledge is not something that stays with you. You forget the knowledge that you have absorbed. Mm -hmm. But the instincts, having the right um, attitude, having the right feeling uh, with a business, this is something that, that stays with you for a while once you build it. So. Um, well, after I graduated from INSEAD, I had to do something. And what I chose to do was to get a job. Not to continue my business, but to, to get a job. Because I mm. thought, you know, if I go to one of the best schools, why don't I go into one of the largest corporations and get that kind of corporate experience? So I did go to uh, Amgen, the big corporate company. Uh, company, because they had a very interesting project. They had a project for expansion in eight countries in Central and Eastern Europe, and I was the project manager for that. And, you know, to do a project management uh, on uh, an international expansion, uh, on a commercial operation with um, a very different um, regulation environment in each of the countries, with very different uh, commercial strategy adapted to the uh, reimbursement environment in each of these countries, was, I think, a, a, was a very challenging and yet a very um, Fit. Very, yeah, very, very fit, very fit job for a you know um, a dynamic MBA graduate and so on. So it, it was a perfect fit. I did that out of Vienna, and then I moved to Switzerland. Uh, they promoted me to Switzerland to do further business development. I did a little bit of business development there. Actually, uh, I spent some time developed some some distribution network outside of the the area where Amgen had their their offices, including Romania at the time. And I came to the conclusion that I would be delivering more value if I came back to my country. Mm. Because there were more opportunities here at the time. And it's about 10 years ago. Um, so uh, I wanted to convince Amgen to you know, set up an office in Romania and assign me didn't as the country manager. The they didn't have any at the, at the time. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I almost did it. Uh, so I got somehow uh, this uh, um, idea of setting up an office here, a small office here, not a full rep office and so on. But by the time I was about to get all the approvals, my boss that was very supportive got changed from his position into a different position. So I said, okay, I, I, I have everything to, got yeah. thrown in the trash. Yeah, it, not thrown in the trash, but uh, into postponement. And I wanted at that time already to come to Bucharest. So I came to Bucharest. I interviewed with a number of um, um, uh, executive search companies and one of the first inter proper interviews, final interviews that I got was with um, uh, Centro Medical Unira, Unira Medical Center. At the time, uh, um, that was the name. Later it became Regina Maria. We rebranded it as uh, Regina Maria. And I got there as a, an executive director, sort of uh, number two with the number one being the owner. And um, the target was very clear that we needed to uh, grow the business aggressively and to, at the same time, um, attract an investor that would be able to work with us to you know, make Regina Maria what basically Regina Maria is today. And uh, it was an amazing experience. Grew that company from 100 people to 1,000 people. Grew the revenue from like 3 million to like 40 million in six years that uh, I spent there. Acquired companies, uh, built hospitals from scratch. Uh, build the organization, developed corporate governance. It was, if you want, applying pretty much everything that I learned in my MBA about growing companies mm -hmm. in that setting. Now, after the second sale, the private equity group that acquired the company, and I did not get along very well. We had different strategy views. Um, I was in charge of a, of, of a part of the um, uh, business and I grew that. The other things were lacking, lagging behind. Some frictions appeared there. So I had to leave. And um, I thought, you know, what else can I do with my knowledge? You know, uh, with my practical knowledge of growing companies and with my theoretical knowledge of growing companies, because I, I have you know this kind of not very uh, often found mix of hands-on experience and uh, theoretical background, and I um, chose you know to brainwash other people 
So I joined the team at Mastic School of Management Romania, and today we have um, not only our um, executive MBA, which is our flagship program, but we have shorter programs. We have Fast Track Management Program, which is an amazing short program for uh, managers. We have uh, short courses. I have an open course of mine that is um, uh, teaching precisely business growth, and I get assignments. Um, to teach in uh, other MBA programs uh, all around the world, basically, within the Maastricht uh, School of Management Network. So um, this, is, this, is, this is something uh, interesting. And at the same time, I thought, you know, this is very nice for my soul and uh, for uh, what I, uh, what I want to do. But also, what else uh, can I do, you know, business-wise? And business-wise, I figured there is this thing of, you know, being a business angel. Now, most of the business angels that you would find are very rich people that have, you know... A lot of money. That they're yeah, a lot, just, ma yeah. lot of money. And, you know, they assign something like, I don't know, 5 or 10% of their wealth into very risky business, which is their uh, business angel thing. Well, I'm not in that profile yet. I have... I had some money. I got out of the stock options from uh, Regional Maria. I got some uh, some money, and I got some money, that, some savings, and some uh, other businesses that I did. So um, not that much, but still, I chose to invest, if you want, most of my money as a business angel, and um, because I thought, you know, this is something that I know how to do, to assist the owner in the growth of a company, to be able to prepare that company for an exit, to be prepared for a transaction to be prepared to grow and make money at the same time. And this is something that, you know, um, it's, it's not my success. It's the success of the business owners and the business founders of the companies that I invested in. But at the same time, I'm really happy when I can really help. And, you know, all these companies that I have invested in, they, each of them grew perhaps 10 times, perhaps 15 times uh, from the moment five or six years ago when I invested. So um, I'm pretty optimistic that we can do many things. Really interesting. And this, so this whole story from since you went and started the MBA and then went to yeah. Amgen, like how long till this point? Like 20 years? Like how long it's, is uh, it? Well, it's, wow, it's 15 years since my MBA. Right. It's 10 years since I came back to Romania. Right. Because the first thing I, I would like to discuss, and I think this is interesting, yeah. because I do have a lot of friends. And the first thing that I... I do have lots of friends as well. Oh yeah, that's good, right? So the thing I've noticed, and I, this is the first topic I want to touch on, is this matter of college and MBAs and everything else. There's like two sides, right? There's one mm -hmm. side like, oh, you don't need it for business. Just go and create your thing and whatever it is. And then the other side like, oh, it really helps. And like, you're proof of that. And there's other people that are, a lot of people that are proof of that. So yeah. what are your thoughts on actually getting a conventional college and MBA in business? Mm -hmm. Because I do think it's immensely valuable um, but what do you think about that? That's the first well, thing. I think, it, I, th I think it depends a lot on the school, and I, I think it depends a lot on the individual. Joke, joking a little bit, I, I used to say that, uh, you know, if you already made enough money that you can hire your MBAs, you don't need an MBA. Right. Interesting. Right. But uh, if you're, you, you don't need an MBA, you still need some formal education, you need to do some advanced management program, that's a different story. But uh, if you're not at that, at that stage, um, you may think pragmatically if you look at your career over the next three years that yeah you don't need it why because your boss didn't have it and perhaps his boss didn't have it right and perhaps some other guys that are very very successful you know even major football players are very successful and they didn't get an MBA you know right but I think if you get to the right MBA it's not only about the knowledge because the knowledge as I said is something that you build and maybe it's not there five years later but you build an intuition and you build an attitude and you have the time aside from your day-to-day -day business together with other smart people that are also thinking of their careers, so the that network are also, also thinking the of their uh, business education and you exchange ideas, you exchange thoughts on business topics. And this is immensely valuable because it enriches your experience without you actually experiencing it. it. So it's fake business experience in fast track delivered into your mind and into your body, into your business feelings, business sentiment, and so on. And this is why it's so powerful. Of course, uh, I think it's a major enhancement for everyone. Of course, you can live your life without it. And uh, I think the most important benefit that you get out of it is not if you want the short-term progress that you may or may not get in the job that you are right now, 
but basically opening up. Of course, you have to be able to be and willing to open up. Sure. Opening up to a whole universe of opportunities and ways of thinking about business, perhaps in a different way than what you were thinking. So it's a it's a journey of self discovery as well. You know? Love it. Cool. So you have let's, to do it one day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely well because I'm I'm fairly young myself, and yeah. I'm I'm kind of like uh, surrounded by all these people that are making millions of dollars and they have not went through almost any way of formal yeah. education. But at the same time, I have my mentors and the people that I respect, and they also like just 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 do it and yeah. like it, because of the network and everything everything else and i'm not talking about stanford yeah. whatever it is yeah. because that's of course the network it's it's like yeah. it's like self filtered yeah. right um, so let's talk about building a company um, and, and the first thing that I noticed, so I know yes. when I was kind of like um, looking at what you do and everything else, mm -hmm. the first thing I noticed is I noticed one of your Facebook posts talking about culture and talking about uh, specifically how people um, talk performance versus growth culture. You shared an mm -hmm. article from, um, yeah. I think, um, some HBR. magazine. Yeah, 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 HBR. HBR. yeah. So yeah. talk to me about that because, for example, for me, I, my agency and everything else, even though we have a small team, the way I approached it, because I've never been employed anywhere really, is like I really put empathy into it. Like what really makes yeah. sense for another person? And I'm seeing a lot of those things in, the, in this growth type of mentality. So yeah. what do you think, like performance growth, like how we should approach it to build a high well, performance? I think, um, I, I think we should take perhaps a step back because right. we, are, we, are, um, um, we are now in Romania and uh, there is this uh, you know, long lasting culture of mediocrity mm -hmm. in this part of the world where you can do things and if they are average everything is okay right so uh, what I think we have achieved in the um, in at least in certain cities in Romania uh, if not in Romania as a whole over the last 25 years is a shift from that mentality into performance mm -hmm. so now I think there is a you know a, a very strong layer of business people of people in all professions, not only in business, um, in Romanian cities that care about the quality of what they are doing and they are really willing to work very hard to do things better and better. Right. Now, better and better is often, and now I'm you know, crossing the borders of Romania or Eastern Europe, better and better is often better than your neighbor better than somebody else while in fact it should be better than you you of yesterday you of today being better than you of yesterday you of today not being as good as the you that you're going to build for tomorrow and this is a route but this route is about performance once again is about having something and making it efficient right having something and making sure that as in school you get a sure or 10 in our European uh, marking system. So if you get that kind of, you know, best score, you're good. Now guess what? In business, if you get the best score, if you do very, very well, what was assigned to you is not enough. You have to do things that no one has taught you how to do. You have to initiate things. You have to distinguish between a good idea and an implementable idea. You have to distinguish between an implementable, imp implementable idea that doesn't make any money and an implementable idea that may actually turn into revenue and profit and value for the society. And this is a shift in mentality that I'm talking about. Right. Because you cannot confine yourself to merely doing things better. And there is a ceiling on how much better is good. Beyond that certain ceiling is only about you know, creating new things. It's about growing, it's about identifying new opportunities, it's about challenging you and the people around you of not doing the things the way that you did it, but doing new things in new ways for new value for new people. Because the world is dynamic. If you don't do it, somebody else will do. Right. And will take your current customers. And will take your current business. So, so are you, you talking about, uh, sorry from are you talking about the Peter Thiel kind of like competition strategy, the blue ocean type of approaching to business? Like are you well, talking about that? Like I don't want to... We are, there, there are many um, theoretical frameworks. Sure. Um, uh, Which again, it's kind of as, yeah. as an inside graduate, of course, I will go into the blue ocean and I will say, you know, this is an amazing book, and uh, Chan, Chan Kim has done, uh, and Rene Moboing have done an amazing job at creating this concept. But now, particular framework 
is there to be applied per se in all circumstances. It's about you to read all those books and understand all those theories. And only when you have mastered them to the extent that you actually understand in your guts what is it all about. And you can actually build things with the bricks that you have acquired from those books and those conferences and those lectures that you have attended. And you have you know, talked with others. And you manage to use these, these bricks to build things. That's only when you have mastered it. And it's mm -hmm. no particular uh, theory that applies. You know, everywhere. It. And it's, you know, like uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. It's very complicated in most of the markets to rebuild something into a Blue Ocean Strategy. But it's always possible to take something, you know, as elementary as um, business um, model canvas of Alex Osterwalder and look at the nine bricks that um, you know, of the uh, business model canvas and see you know on the cost side on the left side what are the things that we can decrease mm. or eliminate and on the right side what are the things that we increase as value to the customer and is there any particular segment that is maybe adjacent to the segments of customers that we approach right now in our business that we can you know, serve with a slightly modified business proposition that will basically create more value. So you allow us to make more money than the competition. So let me just say if I, if I get this right. So basically you're talking about getting the right ingredients for those frameworks and then applying them to find opportunities in your specific case because there's no like Absolutely. framework yep. to, to yep. okay, got there's it. There's no unique framework Love that it. solves everything. Love it. So in, when in regards to culture and people, like just to get back, yeah. and we're going to talk about business growth because I, yeah. I, I had a lot of fun reading your description for your uh, business growth course last year. I had a lot of fun reading the content okay. of that. It was a lot of fun. So before we talk about that, like culture and people management, what right. have you noticed to be like a few principles, like ingredients mm. that you've noticed to be really effective into building high performance teams, into building uh, teams that actually work well together, love the company, love the mission, whatever it is, and actually create everlasting value. Huh. Broad yeah. question, I know. Broad question. I'll, I'll give you only, only one hint. Less yes. rules, more values. Interesting. Less rules, more values. Uh, why, why do I say that? You know, um, I have seen companies where they create their standard operating procedures oh. and they assign a very good guy uh, that is, you know, amazing at the procedures. And he's able to create maybe these very, very detailed procedures. And you end up with a manual that is this thick. Maybe a thousand pages of procedures for Good this stuff. particular company. Amazing. Nobody has ever read it, right? And nobody can ever use it. And nobody it. can ever use it. Yet, you're supposed to bind by those rules, right? Mm. Now, imagine that you would be able to create, you know, something that is maybe you know, two-pager thing with principles and values, and you would apply those. And I'll give you an example, perhaps, from, from the business that I was um, in, the, you know, the... Um, medical business you know you have a hospital you know and it's normal to create a procedure about you know cleaning you know and if you have a very clear procedure you start from you know ward 1 to ward 10 mm -hmm. and you clean them one by one right but then if a patient is sleeping would you bust in and clean because that's the procedure or would you withdraw move further and inefficiently come back later when the patient is awake and would not be disturbed. I love inefficiently there. So. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Good stuff. And then, of course, you will increase customer satisfaction. So what do you have? Customer satisfaction or efficiency? What do you need to build long term in customer your business? Customer satisfaction, of course. Sometimes. Sometimes you need to build efficiency. That's, that's the point. And there are certain business units where you need to achieve efficiency mm -hmm. because perhaps you know all the revenue that you, you you get is reimbursement and stuff like that and you have to make sure that you control your costs but then there are other unit business units and uh, definitely in the new business units and then uh, development area of your of your company you look for customer satisfaction love it and customer satisfaction very wow. interestingly is not about the things that you expect are the things are about the things that perhaps you don't expect and they happen to you, and they are a nice surprise. Yeah, yeah I like think the flowers on our table here. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, let me just touch on that before we get into the business growth stuff. Yeah. Um, for example, the way, I mean, just let me know if this is aligned. So the way we approach, for example, marketing is we really approach it like we call it human marketing. Like we just yeah. look at people and just do the right thing. Yeah. And then you don't know the outcome of that. But man, it's amazing when that happens. So you're saying basically approaching business the same way. Just yeah. treat people right if that's I, the goal. Yeah. Yeah, Treat, just you know, be humane. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's that's very important. But I think you know, um, I, I think there is a, a, a yin and yang in in this uh, in this uh, in the business scenario. And I see lots of you know very inspirational people talking a, a lot about motivation and heart and you know doing things uh, with all your will and passion and so Good on. Will and everything else. And I see lots of you know finance professors talking about numbers and uh, strategy professors talking about the mind. And I think business is equally about mind and heart. Mm -hmm. And I think you have these two wings, if you want. Uh, you have the rational part with the strategy, with the marketing, with the business, with uh, finance and all that. And you have to strengthen that. And at the same time, you have to create that strong customer empathy, that strong employer empathy, em employee empathy. You have to basically love the people around you and use that to better understand and anticipate their needs and desires. Answering to a need today is not enough. There are many people answering to a need of a customer right. and to a need of a person that is looking for a job. That's very basic in the hierarchy of Maslow. Yeah. But going further, you know, Creating a relationship with someone is about, you know, understanding desires, understanding needs beyond that superficial level. And this is about your heart, you know. So it's heart and mind, and they work together. And funny enough, they have to be perfectly coherent independently. So the story that you tell to yourself, the story that you tell to your partners, the story that you tell to your um, employees, and the story that you tell to your customers, has to be perfectly coherent. And the numbers, you know, the business model, the business plan, the financing scheme, the debt to equity ratio, the value that you build in the company, that has to be perfectly coherent as well. Mm -hmm. And only when the two are strong and balanced together can you actually build success. I love that. That's so good because I think there's like, like you said, there's like two kinds of people. One that really like, oh, it's all about heart, and the other people that are about numbers. And when you go in one of two extremes, the other one dies, the other one dies, and yeah. it's, it's not going to be successful. So I really love that. Cool. So business growth. So I was going through your um, business growth management course that you had last year yeah. in like March. I was like, okay, man, maybe he had this course in like three days, but it was 2017. And I had a lot of fun reading the content of it. So I'm going to read the contents and there's like seven topics. One. And then I want to talk about like at least one or something that you think okay. is relevant. Okay. And we can talk about it specifically in an example of a business that you run so that it's specific. Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, they had a lot more sense in Romanian, but we're going to have some fun with them anyway. So first one is the priorities of the business. Right. Um, which had, as if you've been in which I cannot translate yeah. that, I have no means to. Um, the base financial model, manufacturing size matters, development models, strategy elements, value chain, disruptive innovation, blue ocean, and other thick books. Mm -hmm. The Romanian, the thin Romanian version. I do not know how to translate yeah. the, the river. Uh, growing <laughs> pains and risks, agility, scrum, Kanban, and other types of acceleration, and emotions and principles. Let's talk about one. You choose the one that you think is interesting, if you want to see them. But well, you know them I, of course I know them. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I'll, I'll go with the priorities So that we can go into a specific example that's relevant to people. I'll go with the priorities of the business. Right. And I think, um, why? Because that, that's very basic, it's very introductory, and um, I think it's something that gets often overlooked. Right. And I think the first priority of a business, when you ask people, and this happens in a room, they will say, you know, yeah, make money, profit. But funny enough, and other, you know, from the NGOs will say it's people, mm -hmm. you know. But fundamentally, the most important priority of the business is survival. Just be there two years from now. 
And why is that very important? Because more, more often than not, the way that the business is structured, the way that the business world is structured, is that managers are rewarded for the current performance. Managers are rewarded for the current performance means... Short term. If short term versus long term means if I'm in a manager position and I have some goal, some budget to achieve for the current quarter, at least partially my thinking is like this, that, you know, I have route A that will deliver me value in five years from now and I have, but for that I have to sacrifice some short-term gains. Now, short-term gains are about my bonus and my team's bonus, which is more important than my bonus actually for most of the managers. And me being able to keep this team happy and hire more people and grow their salaries and stuff like that, you know? While long-term is probably the success of my successor mm. in my job. You know? right. And even if you have a long-term plan, it's still, not, it's still not going to pay you 10 years from now for your success of today. Because you might not be there. Because you're probably not going to be there <laughs> for most of the companies yeah, 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 yeah. in that position. So the problem with it is that you know, people overlook survival and take risks that are not calculated properly. Dinosaurs have died irrespective of their size because they were unable to adapt, they built inefficiencies, they built, if you want, uh, lack of flexibility. So survival is the most important thing. Then once you have ticked and you have mentioned, you, you have you know, uh, ticked the box with the survival, that's good. Second priority, money. All businesses must make money. And once you've, once you've made money, what else do you need to make? Profit. More money. Oh, okay. Yeah. And once you've made more money, even more money. No. Because right. that's how you know, business is, is uh, structured. There is always an owner um, others, or many other stakeholders that would actually demand you to make more money. That's the metric. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, it. that's how it works. You're supposed to make more money all the time. And I think this is, there is something good in this, even if, even if your business is in fact an NGO. Because if your business is an NGO and your goal is to, I don't know. Have uh, a million feed, people have drinkable yeah, feed, water or whatever. Exactly, exactly. feed um, uh, poor people. You know? Well, you have to be able to feed more people this year than you were able to feed last, last year. year. And that's about you know, fundraising, that's about mobilizing people, that's about you know, growing. And that is you know, when you measure everything, also about you know, growing in money or money equivalent. And the third priority of the business is, you know, the, um, I call it the Miss World stuff. Yeah. It's the kind of things that make this world a better place. You know, the kind of things the impact that, yeah, that you're making. The, the impact that you're making. And this is um, not only because, you know, we are good people and we uh, believe in it, but it's a very pragmatic reason why you need that. In most of the societies, in most of the economies, people do not work for money. People work for money and something else. And that something else is very relevant when? That something else is relevant when you have the opportunity to change jobs and where, when you're really unhappy with what happened yesterday in your job. Where, 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 what, what, your discussion of yesterday with your boss. You know? 100%. So when you had, yesterday you had a bad discussion with your boss and today you have to go to, 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 to work again. You look yourself in the mirror and you find yourself the good arguments. Very nice people, very nice company. It's about those team, team buildings that we do. It's about those social uh, visions and purposes that we have. It's about you know, us hanging out together and you know, going to uh, play soccer every Tuesday or having a beer every Friday right. together as a team. So I'm gonna kind of forgive what happened and move on. But if you're unhappy about those things and you think you, know, you don't have the same values with your colleagues and your boss is a jerk, and the company doesn't live to the espoused values, then probably you're gonna leave thing, or change. You're gonna update your LinkedIn profile and call some people and have some coffees with them. You know? And yeah. the difference is there. 
Because often, if you're really happy in your job and you get a you know a twenty percent higher um, salary Raise proposal budget, yeah. from mm -hmm. somebody else, you still don't change jobs. And While in other situations, you yeah. may change jobs even with less the same money or even less. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's. I mean, in my thoughts, is that makes sense? Still. Uh, so that's, I mean, that, so that's based on the fact that we as humans, we care, mu we care much more about us aligning as values and we care much more about us being like having social interactions and being real people than extra money or lower money. We can live with that, right? But still, we're treated like that in big companies. So that's, that's how you would argue that you keep great people, yep. right? Yep. Because on the money side, like really, how can you compete with like, like there, if, no matter how much money you have to offer your employees, there's still going to be a higher bidder. So if you compete on that, you're always going to be outbid. I mean, theoretically, right? Yeah. So there needs to be something else, and these are yeah. the things that are there for. Nevertheless, to keep you yeah. will you will you will recognize that certain industries pay higher salaries than others. Sure. Because the satisfaction that you know they the people get working in uh, I don't know SpaceX, let's just say like whatever. Yeah, I think that's an interesting it's, thing. Yeah, it's, it's so or or. or you, you look at it from the different angle. If you work in an NGO, people working in NGOs get paid less. Why? Because the they, do, bigger, yeah. they do something that is so important for them and for, for everybody else that this is so fulfilling. Huh? Really interesting. Cool. So do you think we should talk about any other of these things? So we talked about the priorities. Uh, any other things that I think would be, would be interesting? Like we have base model, development model, strategy element, growing pains and risks. Oh, let's do talk about growing pains and risks. Because for a lot of people that are watching, so some of them are maybe corporate and they have like big teams, whatever, but most of them are in the like 10, 20, 30 people teams. Right. So what would you say is the difference? Let's just, let's just take Regina Maria as an yep. example. I think that this is a brilliant, brilliant example. You guys went from 100 to 1,000. That's yep. a big scaling effort, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, we did. So what would you say are like a couple of things that mattered in you being able to scale that and still provide the same quality of services and all those things? Well, I think uh, I'll I'll touch only this. This mm -hmm. is a vast topic. I mean, I can I can talk for one day about you know yeah. growing pains and risks and yeah. how it's how it's done. But I think the most important thing here is to focus on um, that kind of scaling where the business model changes. Right. The business model changes why? Because if you are up to you know. All the sociologists and all the psychologists believe that we humans live in tribes of 150 up to people. 150 people. When your tribe reaches 100 people and approaches 150, you, as the uh, alpha individual running the show, run into major issues because the clan structure, the family structure, doesn't work the anymore. tribe structure doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have to create a federation of tribes and your business has from the human point of view to work as a federation of tribes and that means middle layers and that means communication and systems now middle layer what is that called management what is management management is an expensive resource systems communicating people you know we have to plug in all the data that means you know less time facing the customer, more time doing internal stuff. Mm. That means systems that we acquire from third-party providers. That means costs. Mm -hmm. So suddenly your cost base per unique output, be that you know unique output uh, credit file like for a bank, a patient, like for a um, healthcare company or uh, I don't know, a notebook for Has some factory. Has risen up you know, without any yeah, change your in Your costs per item have increased. What do you have to do? You have to increase the quality and the perception of quality to the level where you can increase prices. Can you do that? Is the quality really going up? Mm. One, once you as the owner of the business are no, is no, are no longer involved with The tendency is to go down. On right. the contrary, the more you grow, the more you have new people that have not been trained properly. And because the people were not trained properly, you have some quality flaws that weren't there in the past. So this is a very shaky situation. Right. This is a gap that you have to be very careful on how you handle and how you make sure you get the right people around you to help you bridge that gap. Right. But I can't go into the, the of details of how you do that. Of course, but that's discussion. so interesting. That's yeah. so interesting. For example, I was looking at 
um, for example, I was looking at Facebook and the way they run their things, and I went into Mellow Park, and they have this, like, it's almost like Disneyland, really, and they, there's like 20,000 people there, and you imagine, how are they doing it? These people seem so relaxed. They really, I mean, they have their schedules free, they're organizing these small teams, and it's, it's like so happy, and we have food everywhere, it's like a party, right? Um, and the reasoning I ended up on, and I, again, I've not analyzed the whole thing, but it kind of dials with what you're saying, is because of their software company, because they, their, their output per resource is so high, yeah. their earnings per employee is, no. are so high, they can afford to do that. It's not like, oh, we need two more products, let's hire 2,000 more people. No, we can do it with eight yeah. people and it's gonna be a scaled result based on the yeah. same output. So, like, that makes so much sense. And in, in a normal company like uh, yeah. your health care centers, that's like your you're limited. But this is this is a very different situation. Right. The unicorns, or actually some of the unicorns, right. um, are in the status of the winner takes it all. Right. You know? And if you're the winner takes it all kind of platform business, the rules of change, you know, economics business and everything else are not exactly the same for you. Right. So you do things completely different. You live in a, virtually in a different ecosystem. You're where you are the big whale, and everything else around you is plankton. Mm. You know, while us, you know, normal businesses, normal people, live in a competitive environment where it matters what is your cost per unit of right. service or product that you deliver. Right. Yeah. So trying to mimic. What the big boys do is going to lead to bankruptcy. Probably is going to lead to bankru bankruptcy. Right. W what you can do at the same time is to make sure that you have a strong culture, that what you can do with what you have is better than who, better exactly than your competition. That you are able to differentiate your, yourself well enough in what you're doing, in how you're treating people, in how you're treating clients, in how you're treating the world around you, in a way that makes a clear difference. Love it. Investment. I know you're an investor, business yep. agent, and everything else. I'm really curious on your investment principles. How do you, if you get like you get a lot of offers, a lot of people asking you for yeah. uh, to invest in them. How do you filter? And what are, what are the investment principles that you have in order to? That's a like, very that's a very good question. Yeah, uh, and I have. Um, uh, Obviously, you're right. I get I get more requests for investment that that what I can serve, and um, definitely even richer business angels that have are doing it uh, more aggressively than than me. You know, they have perhaps a portfolio of ten investments, so they do two investments per year, and that's it. You know, they do two, they exit two, and you know, that that's that's how it works and you get many proposals. So you have to develop some sort of a screening form. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, and like, if, like pretty much everything else in business, this is something where you can prescribe a set of rules that if the rules are not met, you don't qualify. If the rules are met, you qualify, but it's not a guarantee of success. So right. that being said, I would say the most important things are the team. Team has you know, is this team, the entrepreneur, the, the founder, and everybody else around, um, able to run a business? You know, because sometimes you get initiatives from people that perhaps do not have the the right skills to execute. diligence, the um, assertiveness, the experience to run a business. Second, right. are they able to run that business? Because that business means some competence in the area, in the industry that they are acting. Right. Okay? If the business is early stage enough, you have to be able to land some customers. You have to be able to have some sort of unfair advantage compared to everybody else that is competing in that marketplace. So, again, the team. Um, you. Um, you as an investor, or me as an investor, what can you bring I have, to the yeah, I have to bring something to the to the table. So yeah, if you come to me with a proposal and you only need my money, I'm probably not going to give it to you, because unless I can put my brain into it and understand your business model and be able to give you some advices that will be good for your business, then probably I'm not going to be there. And you're better off with a bank, right? In that sense, yeah, sure. Um, if the market, if, if, the, if the bank allow, you know, if you're bankable. Yeah, <laughs> bankable. Okay. Then it's the market. 
It's very interesting, you know, very often I get approached with uh, business ideas that are targeting such a narrow market that even if successful, this is going to be a, you know, a half a million uh, dollar business at the end of the day, or maybe one million. If it reaches and, 100% Okay, something like that. And, I, yeah. and, I, and I'm pretty sure, you know, yeah, this guy's going to be able to build this business. It's going to be, be able to pay him a good salary, but me as an investor, not much opportunity to, you know, be there, part of something that is growing and um, so on. Um, amount. Mm -hmm. Some people need a million dollars, but they pitch you because they know, you know, their value today, they pitch you for the 50,000. Well, if my 50,000 <laughs> come again like 20 don't times. make a difference and can't get you to the level to the next level where you're actually able to get a 1 million from a VC fund or a 1 million from the, the market, from the clients or, or so on, or so on. If the amount is not relevant, then <laughs> it's not going to make sense. <laughs> right. Got it. Very important. A route to exit. So I'm investing in a business, not for my children to be co-owners with your children in that business. My objective is that we build this together and in five years we exit together. And for that I have to make sure that the business that I get into is something exitable. And so the there is an, actually exactly there that. is there is there somewhere in the universe a company, an entity, a fund that may acquire this business from us five years from, from now. And Love there is it. another sort of last possible uh, thing that I would be uh, valuing, having somebody else, having a co-investor, being able to, to syndicate that investment with somebody else. Because if I am or if you are the only person in the universe that believes this is a good idea, then maybe we are wrong. Interesting. And this is what also I think Ray Dalio does. He has for every position in his company like co-CEOs, co-CIOs, yeah. uh, whatever it is. I think that's really interesting. Not a lot of people do it though because they want to stay in their kind yeah. of head. So last two questions. I know we're running out of time. Um, okay, I want to talk about what you think are the most impact creating trends that you see in the next like five to ten years because I know there's so many let's just wow. list them at least let's just list them I know we can yeah. talk for like three hours on blockchain and three hours on self-driving cars and everything else well, what do you think very are very interesting those? because I think you have two layers you know okay the future right. is coming in waves sure. in waves of change waves of change that are you know either taking us on the top of the wave or are, are, at the know, bottom of it at the bottom of it where the fish is <laughs> um, I think there are two ways to look at it. One is you look at your career and your career is something that has perhaps a 10 years visibility. Right. You can build something for the next 10 years and then you look a little bit longer term on what is going to happen to change this universe in the next 10 years. And it's clear that technology as a whole, the top data of as a whole, understanding human behavior as a whole local versus global or actually local and global without the middle you know regional kind of thing mm -hmm. um, are the trends that are very relevant mm -hmm. at this very long stage so if you look at your education then definitely everything that has to do with data analytics with behavioral analytics with critical thinking with ability to empathize these are very powerful skills Right. But will they tell me what to invest in for the next two years? Probably not. And then we go into the, you know, the, biz, the, the technology waves that you, you, you mentioned. The specific and I think that, ones. Yeah, yeah. I think not all the technology waves are actually creating a shift in business paradigm, a shift in business model. Mm -hmm. You see, we talk about blockchain for quite some time, yet for obvious reasons, because everything in the banking sector is controlled by, is, is very well regulated by governments and so on. So it's very difficult for a blockchain paradigm to really replace at a sizable scale the existing paradigm, although it's a superior paradigm, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but it's, let's look at, it's you know, not ready for, yet. yeah, for, let's look for comparison at uh, uh, high definition television. 
Right. High definition television was invented invented in the 80s, yet it became you know available mass, massively available in the 2000s. Why? Because the ecosystem was not there to support it. You know, the ecosystem hasn't shifted. You know, from the, the infrastructure the, that needed yeah, to be in yeah, place exactly. for that to work. Yeah, all the um, um, cable access to television, all the satellites, all the uh, stations, that and even the video quality, also. right? To be able yeah. to put something HD on a HD television. Precisely. So if you don't have all that, you may have a very very nice technology, but that's gonna still be just very the niche, just the technology, not a business paradigm. Right. So in business, we have to judge. What is going to be impactful at business scale over the next three years? And here, of course, I have some certain, certain preferences, but it's clear that in technology, again, if I look at data analytics, one way or another, a bit of, a bit of, not a lot of, a bit of artificial intelligence, machine learning. I think we are going to see a lot more of that over the next 10 years, but we are going to see already applications that are going to make money over the next three years. I'm going to see um, this shift, um, this is actually a shift that is at least 10 years old of people wanting a longer, healthier life. Mm -hmm. So longevity. That's so the thing. this is about, you know, simply, you know, gyms and uh, uh, sports apparel and sport apps and healthy living and uh, good quality food as opposed to rich food and natural and bio and all this thing. Um, there is a trend for uh, regional community-based services and uh, brands. Right. You see all these hipster communities, they all grow to the level where they represent a relevant segment of the market. What's important is to differentiate, is to have our local brands that are not the global brands. And that's why you see a ma massive offensive of the global brands acquiring rather than eliminating lots of small local brands. So th these are the waves and not all, of, all the waves are linked to technology. All the waves are linked to the way we as consumers are perceiving technology and to the way that business can adopt and shift easily from an existing paradigm to a new paradigm. I love it. That's so well explained. So well explained. <laughs> Simply put, it's, I mean, you can obviously see they have a technical background, so it makes sense. Cool. Um, last question. When you're going to be 92, Okay. Uh, what would you like the world? Years. I, <laughs> two years, probably. <laughs> yeah. Or I mean, yeah. ninety-two is probably going to be in the new twenty, right? With longevity and genetics and everything ah, else. So, okay. when you're going to be ninety-two, what would you like the world to remember you by? Quote unquote. Like, what's the impact you want to create in the world so that people can remember you oh, by that? Oh, I'm uh, no, I don't, I don't have that. Uh, you know, uh, picture, heroic picture of myself. I just want to, uh, you know, the people that I interacted with, right. or most of the people that I interact with, to be able to have a slightly, slightly better life and slightly, slightly more optimistic view about their own abilities they after have we have interacted. That's interesting. And that's all. Because I think if we do this, you know, you know the uh, multi-level marketing kind of thing, you know, if we create a multi-level marketing In a good process way. of good deeds at scale, very, very, you know, each of us within our area of influence. This program of yours with the followers that it has. Me, with the people that come to attend my conferences and my classes and people that are my partners in my businesses. Everybody, you know, the taxi driver, the Uber driver, with the people that spend 10, 20 minutes in the, uh, in, in the car. And if that tiny experience allows these people to live slightly better lives, I think we're getting somewhere. That's really good. And that's sort of a not self-centered approach, right? I mean, 
It's in, the, in the between, yes. but I love it. Any case, so yeah. I'm gonna let you go. Thank you so much Thank for you. having the time. I'm gonna have, I mean, guys, for the people that are watching this, we're gonna have all the links to your LinkedIn, Facebook, everything else, so you can check Sergio out. You also have a ton of interviews on YouTube, but there's a lot of them in your Romanian, obviously. Yeah. I haven't got the time to ask you about the Romanian markets and everything else, but I think it was a really interesting conversation. No so thank you so much for having the time. Thank you. And uh, wish you a great day and continue. Thank you so much.